and uh, we are all set. The chair knows the time is 6.01. I call the meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge, as ZBA chair, I wanna welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with a roll call of the ZBA members and panel for this night. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Here. Mr. Philip White. Present. Ms. Sarah Marshall. Present. Mr. Mr. David Sloviter. Here. The quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Mr. Rob Wachilla, planner for the town, and later will be joined by Rob Mora, uh, the building commissioner. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. They may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for, to gain additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen or by pressing nine on their phone. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where the information about the project and the input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must, be, permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2024-01, Amherst Office Park LLC, request for a special permit under Section 5.015 of the Zoning Bylaw to expand an existing caretaker apartment at an office park from 660 square feet to 1,106 square feet with the requested waivers from the management, landscape, lighting, and sign plans at 19 Research Drive, Map 21B, Parcel 82, PRP, Professional Research Park Zoning District. DBA FY 2024-02, Josie DeAngelis and Magnus Wenmeyer request a special permit under Section 3.3241 and 9.22, the Zoning Bylaw, to change the use and expand a non-conforming structure from a two-family residence into a converted dwelling with three units at 65 Taylor Street, Map 14B, Parcel 80, RG, General Residence Zoning District. A public meeting on ZBA FY 2023-15, Kathy Song, 485 Pine Street, to review the following documents with the ZBA regarding a recently awarded special permit ZBA FY 2023-15. Those include an updated lease agreement, management plan, site plan, and a resident manager addendum, as well as its landscaping schedule. 
Following those items, there'll be a period of public general public comment on matters not before the board tonight, other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours, and an adjournment. Tonight, there are no minutes to approve. And so the first, order, the first question I have is, are there any disclosures from the members uh, for the matters before us tonight? All right, the first order of business is ZBA FY 2024-01 Amherst, Amherst Office Park, LLC. Request for a special permit under section 5.015 of the zoning bylaw to expand an existing caretaker apartment and office park from 660 square feet to 1,106 square feet with requested waivers from management, landscape, lighting, and sign plans at 19 Research Drive, maps, map 21B, parcel 82, PRP, Professional Research Park Zoning District. There was a site visit held uh, yesterday, Wednesday, September 13th. I could not attend that site visit, but I did visit the site today and observed it. But I know other members of the board did attend the site visit. And so would somebody like to summarize um, the site visit for us, either Rob or one of the one of the board members who attended the site? Ms. Marshall. Sure. Um, Mr. So three I and Mr. White, Mr. Slobiter, and Mr. Wachilla and um, the owner, Mr. Lavardier. Uh, were there and the owner took us into the main main building, which is office suites, and took us to the end uh, where a break room, a kitchen um, exists now and explained how he wishes to wall that off and knock a door so that it is part of the um, unit at the at the end. The, uh, residents at the end. And we asked a few questions just to clarify that there were going to be no external changes at all. At least that's what we understood. No additions to the building. It's simply uh, reconfiguring the internal space to permit a, a somewhat larger apartment. Um, and it seems to be that the, the reason to do it is that the tenants, that is the office tenants, don't need that much space. So it can be given, in that case, it can be given to the rental unit. Great, good summary. Any other points to make or that were mentioned at the site visit? I should say we also briefly went into the um, apartment. Got it. They're, they're, they're pre at the moment, there's no internal communication, so you have to go. You have to go outside to get back yeah. in. Yeah. Got it. Uh, I, I, I would uh, add one of the things we asked about was parking. The current caretakers unit has two designated parking spaces allotted to it, and that will not change. So the, the end result, as Ms. Marshall described, was is really just reassigning the space that up till now has been used as a break room by the tenants in the office part, it will be added to expand the residence, but no other factor. The, so they will not be assigned more parking. It won't affect it at all. There's actually a sizable parking lot. So if they already, if they have uh, visitors, it's not a problem, but they're not asking for more designated parking spaces or anything like that. No, no exterior changes at all. Great. All right. Um, the following submissions have been received. ZBA uh, FY 2024-01 application and floor plans uh, designed by Carol Vince, dated 7-1-2023 and revised August 7th, 2023. And there were staff submissions the uh, um, site plan review from FY 2022-12, a decision document, uh, site plan review 2020-2002-0-01, a decision document, and site plan review 2020-12-2012-12, floor plans designed by the same Carol Vince dated 2-22-2022 and revised in March of uh, 29th of 2022. Um, I don't think there's, are there any public comments, Rob, or any other additional submissions? 
So I didn't receive any public comments that were submitted uh, before this hearing. I didn't receive any comments from other departments. Um, yeah, other than that, I mean, uh, no comments, um, just uh, procedural no type of change. Nope. Mm -hmm. um, is the, uh, who's representing the applicant and does the applicant wish to speak to this? So we do have um, a Mr. Ron Lavertier who gave us the site visit tour um, yesterday. It's for some reason, there's two accounts that say Ron Lavertier in the, the attendance. So I don't know if, Ron, if you can hear me, could you raise the hand of the account that you'd like me to promote? Oh, never mind. The other one has been taken off and I will promote him to a panelist. Ron, you just have to accept the invitation that I sent to you. He's gone totally. Oh, yeah. Is he a panel? He's not a panelist now. No. Hmm. He may have to check in again. Oh, there he is. There we go. Ron, you're muted. Here. There we go. Mr. Libertier? Yep, I'm here. Can you give us your name and address for the record, please? Ron Lavertier, 433 West Street, Amherst, Mass. Great, thank you. Um, give us your um, rep, uh, summary of the projects you wish to uh, uh, oh. and uh, and we can ask some questions after that. Okay, um, it's a it's a pretty simple process. Just uh, putting a door in between the apartment and the office space um, kitchenette. Um, it actually started when Hart and Patterson asked, they were signing a new lease and they said, geez, Ron, we really don't need the kitchen anymore. Um, is there any way we could take it out of our lease? And uh, there really was no way to turn that kitchen into any kind of rentable space other than attaching it to the apartment. And so um, one of the nice things was I was able to check with my my maintenance person out there um mac rogers and i said mac geez you know would you <laughs> would you mind a little extra space and at first the, the funny thing was he first said no no i don't really need it ron don't worry about it but then he mentioned it to his girlfriend and uh within <laughs> a day and a half that answer was now changed and they would <laughs> love to have this <laughs> so that was kind of the story behind it. Um, you know, Hart and Patterson, you know, recognized that paying rent on a kitchen that they use for perhaps once a year was was kind of silly. And, uh, you know, at, at your, your general rent out there is running around $20 a square foot uh, fully serviced. Um, and so there was 340 feet that they were paying on that they really didn't 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 see the benefit in. So we're actually helping out two people at the same time. I'm helping out the Hart and Patterson business and Mac Rogers and his girlfriend that uh, that presently live there and maintain, uh, you know, the the outdoor and indoor quality of the building. Great, Mr. Libertier. I I believe that the reason you need a special permit is because you're increasing the square footage of the caretaker apartment from under 10 percent of the total square footage to over 10 percent is that, that is right correct. so yes. there's no other no other changes um that you're requesting nope. Except, yep all right i have no further questions uh does anybody have questions <laughs> mr wachilla so actually um you can get uh, Philip's question first. I'm actually just going to remind you of um, the waivers you have to request okay. afterwards. We've got yeah several waivers. Mr. White. Hello. Um, I just wanted to confirm. I know we touched on it a little bit yesterday, but just confirm that that rear deck um, will continue to be used by both the caretaker unit as well as the commercial um, property. Yeah, the commercial, it, it's all used by the commercial um Hart and Patterson that their four room commercial space because they're the only ones with a door that actually accesses the deck. 
but yes, it's it, it's to be shared by both parties. So that it's not, you know, it's a pretty good sized deck when you get on it. Yeah, it's almost two sections to it, you know. Great. All right, and Mr. Libertier, you're asking for waivers from, let me get this straight, um, management plan, which, uh, a new management plan, a landscape plan, a lighting plan, and a sign plan. The reason you're asking for these is that there are no changes to those. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. So the normal pro uh, any other questions from me board members? Um, this would be the time for any public comment. If people have, uh, if any member of the public wishes to speak to this issue, either uh, please ind indicate by raising the hand function on your Zoom uh, client or pressing nine if you're on the phone. I don't see any, Rob, do you? No, and just a, a reminder, it's actually star nine for the phone. Um, so folks Thank who are you. calling in, press star nine. Give them a minute to do that. Mm -hmm. Looks like there are no requests for public comment. Nope. If there are no further questions from the board or, or statements from the applicant, I will move from the public hearing process to the public meeting process while keeping the public hearing open in case we need to gather additional information. This time is generally not a time for public discussion and it's a time when the board deliberates. Um, my, my impression of this is that it seems to make a lot of sense. There's, a, there's no harm in increasing, it seems to me, in increasing our public interest in limiting the increase in square footage from 660 to, to 1100 square feet. Um, they need a, to do that, they need a special permit and there's no changes to the uh, management, landscape, lighting, or sign plan, so I don't need to see why we need to have, we, why we can't give a waiver for a creation of new site plans, um, et cetera. Um, so other people have any other comments, concerns? Uh, Mr. Sloviter. My only comment is that from visiting the site yesterday and listening now, this seems like a very reasonable request a good use of the space, no point in leaving valuable space empty. It has no effect on anything outside of the building. I think this is very straightforward and, and entirely reasonable. Ms. Marshall. And I would add that um, the applicant said that enlarging the apartment which will permit a larger kitchen um, than exists currently for the custodian's use, makes makes the job more attractive because the living space is, is um, larger and, and he would like to keep his caretaker. All right. Mr. White, what we normally do, since, since this is the first time I've uh, run a meeting with, and you've been part of this, is what we typically do is go through the uh, conditions first so that we can make the findings we have to make. And a lot of times the conditions are what allow us to make the required findings. The staff has suggested several conditions. All of those can possible condi the on the project application report, the five possible conditions make sense to me. Let me run through them quickly. And um, if people have an objection or a change to any of them, please, uh, indicate after I've run through them all. The first one is the project will be built and maintained according to the approved plans and application package. This is a standard um, condition that we have on almost every uh, special permit. Said changes shall be reviewed and or approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public hearing or if the change is significant enough, said changes shall require a formal modification of the permit or the condition. The approved plans include the floor plans created by Carol Vince, sheet A-1. 1.1, it's untitled, but dated July 1st, 2023, and revised August 7th, 2023. Management plan approved under site plan review 2022-12 shall remain in full effect and shall govern the excess, accessory chair, excuse me, caretaker apartment, that's hard to say. The conditions from site plan review 2002-0001 and site plan review 2022-12 shall remain in full effect. The number of bedrooms shall not exceed one for the accessory apartment. 
The accessory apartment shall only accommodate a manager, a custodian, a security guard, or other employee essential to the operation of the office park. The employee's immediate family or household could be accommodated as well, but only if in agreement with the property owner. Those are suggested by staff. Ms. Marshall. Yes, I, um, I don't think that condition number four is needed. There'll be room for a second bedroom if there's a, a child, a family wants, needs a second bedroom. I think that is fine. I don't know if the original permit specifies the bedroom and we have to explicitly change it, but I, if not, I would just remove this condition. Um, Rob, does the site plan review limit the bedrooms? Do we? It didn't know, but I figured if the board wanted um, to cap, I guess, the growth, because it's always been a one bedroom, I kind of suggested it. But if the board doesn't feel it's necessary to include it and is OK with a second bedroom possibly be added in the future, we can easily remove that condition. Uh, I have no objection to dividing up the bedroom in case there's a child or a need for two bedrooms. Anybody have any concern about that? All right, then my, and then, so I, I think we have consensus to remove number four. We'll get back to that in a second. And then we had a couple of conditions that the board might want to discuss dealing with visitors and um, um, parking spaces. I, have you had any problems? I guess I've not known of any problems with the visit, number of visitors or parking spaces. There seems to be a lot of parking spaces. I'm not sure either of these two conditions need to be imposed on the property. I'm wondering if anybody else has, a, has an opposite opinion. All right. So what I would move. Sorry, would Mr. Move. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. I I don't object. I don't object to them, but I wonder if we can ask the applicant if he would like them to remain. If, are they have he they been control, needed? <laughs> he's I'm, he can control both via the lease if he needs to. I guess. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Mr. Lavernier, do you have a do you have an opinion about either of those conditions? Uh, um, can you hear? Yep, we can hear you. No, we can't. Uh, now I can't. Yeah, right there. Right there. There, yeah, we right mm -hmm. there we go. There we go. Good. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're good now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, we have twenty-one spaces out there presently, I believe. And, you know, we've never been full okay. uh, from the parking parking standpoint of, of um, the needs for the building. But it's a very quiet office building. And, and most of the time, there's five or six or seven open spaces, even on the busiest of days. So, you know, I mean, it, I, you know, the, the visitors come and go, and, and nobody's ever had a problem. So I, I don't anticipate ever seeing one. Um, yep. I guess that's kind of my on the parking issue. Right. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I guess, it, it, you know, if it was a, a, a highly active building downtown, it might be a very different thing. But it's kind of a, you know, it's sort of tucked out in the quiet area with, you know, with very, you know, with people that, you know, we have engineers in there and we have, yeah, you know, people that, that work in the computer field and they don't have a lot of visitors. So it's been, it's always been very, very lightly used at parking. All right. And if you have um, a desire to either limit guests or to, to um, impose limits on parking in the future, you can do so via your lease if you need be, right? Uh, of course I could. Yes. Okay. So my thinking, and I'll leave it open to the decision of the board, but my thinking is that we do, don't need the to impose the, the condition, possible conditions one and two. Um, and so what I guess I would like to do is entertain a motion to approve conditions under possible conditions of approval, uh, one, two, three, and five, leaving out number four, which um, limits the number of bedrooms. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, uh, the vote occurs on the motion to approve those four conditions. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Ms. Slobiter? Mr. Aye. Slobiter? Aye. Motion carries. 
Um, we now need to make some findings um, under and approve waivers. So let's first approve the waivers on the um, waivers for the management plan, landscape plan, lighting plan, and sign plan. Um, do I have a motion to approve waivers for those four items? Uh, so moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve waivers for management, landscape, lighting, and sign plan. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Sloboder? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Next, we have to um, make certain findings in order to permit the, uh, in order to issue a special permit. These findings are under 10, section 10.38. Um, the first ones are 10, and Mr. White, for your information, what we do is we go through these findings. If one wants to pull, we try to approve them and, and block. If one wants, if somebody wants to pull out a finding or amend it, we take it out of the, the end block and we deal with it separately, but hopefully we don't have to have 20 different votes. So we're trying to do this as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, the first one is 10.38 and 10.381. If this pro proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood in which it is proposed, then or the total town is deemed appropriate by the special permit granting authority. Uh, you know, this is proposed accessory use comports with section 5.05 015 and allows for the, the ZBA to grant a special permit to increase the caretaker apartment. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387 generally new, deal with uh, various nuisances and inconveniences caused by the project to the neighbors or the neighborhood noise, flood, odor, dust, vibration, lights, visually offensive structures, or site fences. Um, the proposal does not make any outward. Uh, doesn't increase any nuisances. Indeed, it doesn't create any um, outside changes at all. Um, 10.384, adequate and appropriate facilities provided for the proper operation of proposed use. The caretaker apartment already exists. Adding 400 square feet does not um, make these, does not create a problem for the adequate and appropriate facilities. 10.386, proposal ensures it is in conformance with parking and sign regulations. The management plan will remain in effect and parking and sign plans. 10.387 deals with safe and, and convenient vehicular traffic. Again, this uh, really doesn't apply to this special permit. 10.388 dealing with um, adequate space for off street loading. 10.389 dealing with methods of disposal of sewage waste and refuge. 390 dealing with flood hazards. 391 dealing with um, landscaping, etc. Um, 393, dealing with um, protection of adjacent properties by minimizing intrusion of light and other uh, things to the neighboring properties. 10.394, um, impact on slopes. And 395, uh, creating disharmony with the architectural structure. 96, dealing with screening. 97, dealing with recreational facilities. None of these are applicable to this um, special permit because we have no, for the most part, because we have no exterior changes. Lastly, 10.398, the proposal is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of this bylaw and the goals of the master plan. This creates uh, better workforce and more attractive workforce housing and is aligned with the goals of the master plan. So, if there, unless there's a, Ms. Marshall. It's not an objection, but I just want to note something uh, with regard to 10.387. Um, yep. I, I agree that the section doesn't apply, but I want to note in the comment, the staff review comment, I, I think it would be more accurate to say the number of units, of residential <laughs> units. We, in fact, the bedrooms might good change. change. Good, that's a good catch. Okay. Um, that's a good catch. Actually, um, I took note while you're going through that and I, I wrote to get rid of increase in bedrooms, but thank you for saying that because it's actually a good way to reward it. So um, okay. I will definitely do that. Great, good catch. Okay. Thank you. If there are no um, other comments regarding the conditions, I would entertain a motion to approve the conditions on the as stated. So moved. So moved. And I, Mr. Sloviter, is that a second? <laughs> it can be a second. <laughs> sure. All right. I wasn't we got sure it. if it was a first. It can be either one you want. <laughs> However, you want to use me. <laughs> it's a convenient second. Thank you. Uh, is there any further discussion? 
not the vote occurs on uh, 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 imposing the follow those conditions. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. All right. Conditions are approved. Um, Give me the findings. The findings. You said conditions. Do you mean? <laughs> Yes, excuse me. The findings are findings are approved. Yes, the findings. Ten point the findings under ten point three eight are approved. So um, that means we've approved the findings, we've approved conditions, and we've made the waivers. The next order of business is to uh, approve the special permit and to close a motion to approve the special permit and to close the hearing and public public hearing and public meeting. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All right, Mr. Meadows, the motion has been made and seconded. Um, is there any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the special permit as with conditions, um, with findings and with, ver uh, with um, waivers and to close the public meeting and public hearing. Um, this requires four positive votes. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Sloboda? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Mr. Labertier, congratulations. You've got your special permit. Mr. Wachilla, you have something to say? I was going to ask uh, for the permission of the chair if you want me to go over the next steps with the applicant. Um, or, sure. Yeah, okay. So, so Ron, basically what's going to happen next is that early next week I'm going to start working on your uh, record decision. So basically it's a fiscal document I'm gonna type up uh, that records the vote taken today. And then afterwards, I'm gonna reach out to each of the board members and they're gonna sign it. And then once they sign it, I submit it with the town clerk's office and that starts a 20 day appeal period. So basically what that means is any member from the public can appeal the decision of the zoning board on the special permit to uh, a court, higher court, usually superior court or land court. Don't think it's going to happen for this particular permit, but I just wanted to tell you that's what usually would happen. Um, and after that 20-day appeal period ends, you would have to get a certificate of no appeal from the town clerk. And then once you get that, you take it to the Hampshire County Registry Deeds, um, have it filed, and then the special permit becomes effective. Do you have any questions for us? No, nope, that's pretty much what I thought would happen. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great day. You bet. Congratulations. Thanks. All right. Um, the next order of business had been to take up the um, ZBA 2024-02, but in anticipation of that, I know we we're supposed to have Rob Mora on to, to help explain some of the more complicated parts of converted dwelling. He, I know he's going to be joining us, but he is a little bit later than um, he's later than we thought, and I would like to have him as part of that hearing, just because converted dwellings can be technical. Um, and so what I'd like to do is move to the public meeting, temporarily move into the public meeting on um, 485 Pine Street. I think we can dispose of that quickly. And then we can go back to the um, um, the uh, um, Taylor Street application. Yep. So let's, let's do that. Let's move, to, unless there's an objection, let's do that. So the next order of business is um, ZBA FY 2023-15, we're in a public meeting now, 2023-15, Kathy Song, 485 Pine Street, to review the following documents with the ZBA regarding a recently awarded special permit, ZBA FY 2023-15. Those uh, documents are, include an updated lease agreement, updated management plan, updated site plan, and a resident manager addendum, as well as a landscaping schedule. All these come from um, condition 19 of the special permit. Uh, to me, this seems to be pretty straightforward. Um, and generally, this is what I have, what I have seen it seems to be in compliance with the condition 19. Um, does the applicant feel a need to speak to this? So we have in attendance, uh, Kathy Song. And um, if you'd like, Mr. Chairman, I could promote her to be a painless so she could uh, answer that question for you if you like. Okay. And then also, Mr. Chairman, I have um, a list of the required updates to each of those documents. So if you want me to go through them before uh, Ms. Song gives her uh, presentation, I'd be more than happy to do so. Well, yeah, that'd, be, that'd probably be helpful, Rob. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, sure. So I'll um I guess I'll go and summarize that real quick. So um what was required of the applicant Kathy Song for 45 Pine Street? Um, as a reminder, this was an approved special permit, but there were five revisions that had to be done in order for the applicant to get her final building permit to construct the um, three units. So the first requirement was a landscaping schedule that includes contact information of the landscaping company and maintenance schedule. The applicant has since provided all the information to us. We The second item was an update lease agreement that includes language of parking space number to six, um, three spots per unit. The lease agreement has been updated and was submitted to town staff with the correct number of parking spaces to match what's on the plans. The third item was um, an on-site manager addendum document for the lease. Um, so basically this use requires to have an on-site manager um, or a manager who would live in the building, like a resident manager. They have since submitted that documentation to us as well. The fourth item is updated, updated site plans showing the parking shifting westward and additional plantings along the parking area and hitching post road, as well as parking signage detail. They did update the plans to include the signage detail. They did shift the parking more westward away from the property line. And I believe that was the suggestion of Mr. Meadows during that public hearing to do so. And they propose um, additional plantings along the Eastern portion of the parking area to block headlights from hitting Atkins Farm, which is on the Eastern border of that property. They have since submitted those site plans to us and then also is included in the board's packet. And then the last item they had to submit was updating the management plan, uh, which includes resident manager, language on resident manager, and then updating any landscaping information. The applicant has done both of those and submitted the updated management plan as such. All five of those revisions, the documents pertaining to them were included in the board's packets. And uh, Mr. Chairman, that's pretty much all that was required. And the applicant did submit all the information to us. They also submitted um, a change in the lease regarding the number of guests at any one, any time, mm -hmm. the 10 per unit. So that's highlighted in the, yep. in the lease as well. Okay. Ms. Song, do you feel uh, you wish to discuss this? Is there anything you need to first identify yourself and um, give your address and let us know if you need to speak to this? Oh, I mean, what should I say? <laughs> well, it, it seems pretty straightforward, but if you feel if you feel a need to, to speak to it at all, you may. But I mean, I think it's pretty straightforward what you what you've uh, submitted and comports with what we asked for uh, in uh, in the special permit pro process. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> yeah, every progress was not easy on me, but you know, here we are. You know, you guys actually helped me really a lot of idea that I supposed to follow. And then I hope that you know, Ben, um, I thought that he's gonna be join us, but you know, if this all the file um ed um edited file actually helped the, my plan. So, yeah. And then, you know, the other thing I want to add that you guys was actually asking about, you know, uh, bees and uh, bees and birds or butterfly, those kind of a nature thing. But, you know, I don't know you guys already went there or not, but it has a lot of like, you know, first Sia and then lilac and already perennial there. But right now it's abandoned a pretty long time. It doesn't show beautiness. But I will actually keep it as my house, you know, the other actually project that, that I actually finished it with, a, you know, 52 stage coach. And then maybe, you know, all neighbor is actually really glad that I am doing it. So maybe this property will be the same. Okay. So I'm not just, you know, try to finish it up and then gone. I will be, I, I actually live in Amherst. I, you know, before actually I told you I'm the resident here. I do care about the Amherst. So their property you will see that I am going to do, which is it's going to be really nice looking. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Song. Would you just give us your address for the record? Say it again? Just give us your address for the record. Oh, yeah, yeah. So 485 Pine Street, Amherst, Massachusetts, 01002. But you you live you don't live there right now. You live on Yeah, yeah. Road. I live in 52 Stagecoach Road, Amherst, Massachusetts, 01002. Thank you. All right. Um, I have no further questions of the applicant. Does 
Anybody else have anything? I think, yeah, Ms. Marshall. Just a question, and I'm new to this project. I wasn't on the earlier, so I'm, I, I just don't know whether, whether an on-site manager, I'm looking at the addendum and the responsibilities for this person. Is this person responsible for enforcing uh, the noise? Like if people are making noise that it's too loud, you know, to ask them to turn it down so the neighbors aren't calling. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I actually have the on-site manager, plus I live in, you know, I, I live myself in Amherst, it's only 10 minutes away. So. <laughs> Right. All other, you know, property is trying to be under control. Whenever I had a complaint, I'm actually really actively involved there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sure. All right, Mr. Wachilla. So I don't tend to ask a lot of questions, but mostly just bring up statements of facts. So I just want to remind the board that um, for this specific action, the only thing you really have to do is just take a, a vote. And it's a simple majority, so that means at least the three out of five members have to vote yes to, to approve these um, update documents. And then Ms. Song can go ahead and pursue her building permit to start construction on the units. I'd entertain a motion to approve the documents. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, the vote occurs as Mr. Wachilla said it only requires three positive votes. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Uh, unanimous. Uh, motion carries. Ms. Song, uh, you have your uh, documents approved. You can get your building permit. Thank you so uh, much. Good luck to you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Great. Now I'd like to return to the uh, our last item for the evening. I know Mr. Moore, the building commissioner, has uh, been able to join us, and I, I'm, I'm glad because sometimes dealing with uh, converted dwellings becomes complicated. And between our two Robs, we'll have uh, the we'll have all the information we need and all the help we we need to make a decision on this. The next order of business is ZBA FY 2024-02. Josie DeAngelis and Magnus Wenmeyer request for a special permit under section 3.3241 and 9.22 of the zoning bylaw to change the use and expand a non-conforming structure from a two-family residence into a converted dwelling unit with three units, into a converted dwelling with three units at 65 Taylor Street, Mat 14B, Parcel 80, RG, General Residence Zoning Districts. Um, there was a site visit on Monday uh, we, at which we walked the property from the, out to the exterior. We looked at the, um, the building itself, the, the, the two front units. We looked at the exterior of that. We observed the connector, which is between the house and the garage and the barn, um, and observed the, um, the, the, um, roof that had collapsed on the, the extent on the uh, con, uh, connector. We observed the barn and we looked at the, um, the uh, condition of the um, exterior, um, I think they're called king boards, and looked at the condition generally of the, of the roof in that as well. We walked around the property to see how close it was to the neighbors and the reason for its non-conformity, um, pre-existing non-conformity um, to the the, uh, the zoning bylaws and the, and the requirements. And lastly, we also observed where they, the, there was concern at one point about drainage, uh, where the pipe was and how there's going to be a rain garden in its place at per suggestion of the, um, the public works, Jason Skeel of the public works department. Um, we asked a lot of questions about parking. We observed where the parking was um, and where the, how the, there was going to be parking in the barn and parking along the the, um, the property, and I think there was some there was some questions about clarifying what the, the the number of cars and where those cars would be parked. That seems to be what I remember from that site visit. Is there anything that other people wish to mention in terms of the site visit? Rob, you had some questions that you 
shared with all of us. Um, and I think I covered them. Maybe I missed one. Uh, let me just take a quick look, Mr. Chairman. I don't think there's anything you missed, but I am just going to double check on that just to be safe. Okay, so it looks like in terms of the questions, you hit the number of cars parked in the driveway. I believe there was a question about um, the height of the first floor for the connector um, because Mr. Sloveder noticed that it was about five feet off the ground when we went to go see it. Uh, he just wanted clarification on how high that first floor is going to be from the grounds. Um, I believe the applicant mentioned that there was going to be a crawl space underneath of the first floor, which is supposed to be turned into a kitchen. And then lastly, there is a question about inviting their builder or architect to be present during the public hearing, which I believe their um, their builder is going to be on, their contractor. So uh, that's pretty much all the questions I had written down during the site visit, and I think you hit them all, Mr. Chairman. All right. There's no other uh, questions to be raised. I want to note the submissions um, from the Z. We have ZBA FY 2024-01, an application form, an application packet, project summary, lighting plan, garbage and recycling plan, landscape plan, storm water drainage, sign plan, and parking plan. Uh, bicycle storage, management, complaint response form, sample lease, a rental application form, a quote from the fire service group for the sprinkler system, a map showing the three family homes within 1 16th of a mile, and maps showing all three family homes in Amherst. For ZBA FY 2024-02, um, we have plans, um, sheets 0, 0.02 to um, <laughs> C-2, which include title page, existing site, site plan, lighting, setbacks, converted dwelling calculations, footprint calculations, basement, first floor, second floor, loft and roof plan, north and east elevations, south and west elevations, um, sections of uh, A3 and A3.0 and A3.1 sections dated 4, 10, 23, wall sections, existing basement plan, first floor, second floor, existing north and east elevations, existing south and west elevations, existing sections, a drainage plan designed by Berkshire Group, revised 828 to 2023, and a drainage plan designed by Berkshire Design Group dated um, 621, 2023, and revised 828, 2023. Have there been any pub other submissions or any public comments? I didn't see any on the, on the website. So I didn't get any public comments sent to me about this. Um, and then the comments received from town staff was only from Jason Skeels, which was included in the project application report. Yeah. Other than that, I do not have any other comments or submissions are given to me um, prior to this project application report being created. Great. I think that summarizes all the material that we received and uh, I guess it provides us now the opportunity to listen to the applicant uh, to see if they want to how they wish to present this um, special permit application. So can you put, um, I guess it would be Mr. Wen Meyer and the yep. builder, who is that? So I do not know the name of the builder, but I'll promote uh, Mr. Wen Meyer to be a panelist. They have to accept that invitation. And then they can tell us who their builder is if, if they're on the call. Hi. Hello. Um, please give us your name and your names and address, please. We are uh, Jody D'Angelis Wenemir and Magnus Wenemir, 47 Gray Street, Amherst, Mass. Great. Thank you. And did you bring your, did you folks also have your builder to speak? Yeah, Mike, well? Mike Stoltz should be there. Uh, nice. I see, do not see a Mike Stoltz. I see Mike Wapinski, Kathleen Bridgewater. I don't, I don't see him on the call. Um, I don't know if you want to contact him real quick, just in case, or if you wanted to move forward with that, that's totally up to you. Well, we can, we can proceed without him, but he was mm -hmm. supposed to be here. I'll, I'll just I'll I'll text him real quick and see. Okay. We have a Kathleen Bridgewater and a Simskaya Dami, and then uh, a Michael Lipinski. Uh, his sons are Tyler and uh, Cody. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, 
we'll uh, give him a note and and then we you can start with a description of the project and uh and what you intend to do okay and just yeah. a heads up um josie and magnus you do have screen sharing capabilities so if you guys had any documents or plans you want to show on your screen you definitely could or during your presentation, if you wanted me to pull up anything like from your plans, just let me know and I can do that for you. Oh, that would be super. Thank you. I'll ask you to do that. There's a lot to manage. Um, no worries. So, um, so I'm Josie of the Magnus and Josie. And um, so we're, it's about the 65 Taylor Street and to um, do something with that barn that is in very poor condition. And um so we have the architectural plans, and I know there was a question about parking, and um, I I don't know where to where to go with this. Um, we'd like to build a, a third unit there that will be owner occupied. Um, we're going to abide by all building codes and everything, uh, including uh, with getting the whole thing sprinkled, you know, with water sprinklers that will be retrofitted throughout uh, the house, including the existing uh, two family home that's there now. Um, what else? I'm sorry. I, I guess what I guess would be helpful, um, Mr. Angelus and Mr. Wenmeyer. Just your goal is to in, increase the number of units, dwelling units you have by one. And yes. Tell us where you want to do that and well, how you want to do that, and then we'll talk about the parking after you go through briefly the what, what you wish to do with the barn and the converter. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah. So we'd like to um, add a third dwelling unit um, in place of where uh, the barn and and, uh, and connector are. So actually in the footprint of those, those structures and retain the structure that's there, the framing and things like that. But of course, reinforce it so that way uh, it's engineered properly so that way it can support um, the structure. And um, and that it'll be three bedrooms, um, one and a half baths, and uh... okay. And from the, your view, are you expanding the footprint of the building of the new, or not the new, but of the barn or the yeah. connector? Okay. Yes, the barn, both the barn and connector, will be brought out by about five feet from where the front of those units would be, which would be the um, east facing wall of the structure. Uh, okay. That is all. And then I, I guess, I, I don't wanna just dis disrupt your presentation, but maybe this is helping you. And, and if it isn't, <laughs> it is. <laughs> but I'm trying to, to facilitate this. And the other, other thing that we have to know is how much, how many square feet you intend to add from the in the connector and in the barn to what is existing square footage. So, how much new living living space square footage do you intend to add to your structure? Okay, I'll have to look at. I have our plans up here now. Um, so I think right here. Um, isn't that it? I believe. I believe that's on our plans on, yeah, page, on page seven. On page, we're, share, we're sharing our screen right now. Oh, we are. Yep. Oh. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> it's actually uh, on the plan. It's zero point six, page zero point six, and yep. it shows up here in the box um, at the top the um, the existing footprint and and how that will change. And I think the key there is the habitable space resulting from new building footprint. That's what the right. what it all comes down to, and, is my understanding. And that's at right. 6%. So let's go through that. Can we go through that calculation of 6% again? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so what ha So the gray area that's over here on the other side of the screen, I'm moving my mouse. I hope you can see that. Um, that gray area represents the um, the footprint being extended from where it exists right now, and um, and that calculation of six percent is based on this footprint. It's scrolled down a little bit there. Okay. Also. But I guess so. That's the new, and, and so that's the new. Um, that's the only footprint. area of the footprint that's being extended for habitable space. Right, but I, 
what I was under the impression is that the current garage um, is two floors and you're going to have an, you're going to have two floors in the, in the uh, connector and then the garage is going to have two floors plus a loft. Right. So the, oh, right. So the so square footage of the building is more than, would be more than 6%. Is that right? The square, the number of um, the amount of, of space that you have in the, in, for livable space inside the building is going to expand by more than 6%. Correct. Yeah. Yes. It's the new building footprint that has, that's associated with um, habitable space increasing by 6%, but the existing building footprint and all the habitable in, uh, space will also increase, of course, as well. Um, that's in this box right here. Sweetie, can you read that for me? Because I'm. <laughs> So the, the footprint expansion, um, oh, that's that's the new, new footprint, habitable space resulting from, and that's habitable space resulting from the new building footprint. So I think we're on the wrong page because we no, need to. No, I think this is right. I think this, so basically. But we need a uh, number. Well, well I, I guess, well, you know, we'll return to the, I don't want to bog us down here if you have other things you want to. Okay, so, so these areas here uh, that I'm, uh, yep. Highlighting right now. Uh, I don't know which one corresponds oh, to which. Uh, there are three spaces here. This is the second floor of the, this is the loft of the barn. This mm -hmm. is the first floor uh, livable space of the barn. And this is uh, the first floor of uh, the connector. The second floor of the connector is not affected by the uh, additional um, footprint. Because it's, it's not affected by the footprint, but it's total square, it's increased total square footage. That right. Yeah, exactly. I know you're looking through the total square footage. I know we yeah. have it in our, so, plan. in our architectural plan. Sorry, it's a, it's a lot to. Yeah. Okay. So, so he, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's new. So there's, there's really two, there's two things to consider. There's footprint and there's square footage. And that's, that's what we're trying to, I'm trying to get a number for that. Right. All right. And because that does deal with, um, of how you how you consider a, a converted dwelling okay. it's an important calculation for that as well um miss did i see a hand up from somebody mr mora yeah i just uh suggestion to magnus and josie if you go back one page to sheet five on your plans that's a good diagram to talk oh, about yeah. total square oh, yeah, footage so that's the habitable space calculations Thank and you. you know it's broken down by the unit and and i think you, you can go through how the yellow is the new square footage and the numbers are right there on that table uh that's the beginning of how you start to create the calculation that you need to that's you know related to the footprint that you've already started talking about thank you so much i get lost in these plans i appreciate that <laughs> all right so now i are you still seeing our screen yep Okay. Yep, we've got it. There we go. So, <coughs> so there we have, um, as Rob Mora very gracefully pointed out, the yellow on this page indicates new uh, living space, new habitable space. And um, so on the first floor, we're going to have a total of 292 square feet. On the second floor, a total of 932 square feet and uh, the loft of 265. And so the total habitable space will be 1489 square feet. And that represents the yellow portion of what's on this page. And so the existing square footage of the of units one and two is 3672 minus 1489. Correct, yes. All right. And so you increase by whatever that percentage is of right. gross habitable space, okay. All right, I'm done interrupting your presentation. No, no, <laughs> interrupt more, interrupt more, because um, yes, this is this is what we'd like to do. Um, the building is is deteriorating, um, and we would really like to uh, shore it up, get it all safe and well constructed, and um, and move forward as swiftly as we as we can. Um, I've already asked a couple of questions 
Do you want us to stop I'm assuming you're, you're done with your presentation and yeah. we can ask questions, questions from the board. So are there members of the, of the board who have questions? Not, I think I don't, about the living space. No, but, just about the, about the application itself. About anything about it? You yep. mean? Oh, okay. Anything. Well then, <laughs> just to go back to the parking for a moment, I think what was confusing to us when we visited was that we saw cars par parallel parked between the two trees at, near the beginning of the driveway. But what the very first page of your plan shows so 0, 0.0 is, is the plan is to have one space that's a parallel park parking space between the trees. It looks like four new spaces further along outside. And then you have two in the garage. So that's the seven. Yeah. Yes. And I got an answer from my architect about that. Okay. And the reason is, is that um, the way the cars are parked there now, like when you were there, right. their headlights are facing the back of the house yeah. that, that's on the other side of the fence. And so given that we have so much room for parking, he said, uh, we should just have a parallel parking right there because then the headlights won't be shining into anybody's residence. Mm -hmm. And then since we have so much room at the back of the driveway, add uh, four additional parking spaces there on the diagonal. So they're all gonna face the existing uh, plantings that we have there. And right. again, to avoid uh, shining the headlights into anybody's house. Right, okay. That was his answer. Got it, <laughs> thank you. And is, is that um, protocol for parking contained in a document? Yeah, it, it should be in the, in the plan that, that, that you have. So exactly as the um, submission is from the architect would be what we're going to follow. So I'm seeing, all right, one, I've got five parking spaces. I'm looking at C1, is that correct? Is that what zero, I should be looking at? Zero point zero, the very first front of the set. Yes. Okay. Zero point zero. And then, yeah, if you- Yeah, we said- 0 0.2 actually. Oh, okay. So you have one between one parallel parking space between the two trees. Yes. And then you have two, three, four, and five angled at the back of the, uh, not the, in the middle of your property, not the back of your property. Right. And you have two in the barn. Yes. So you have a total of seven. Yes. Okay. So you have to amend your plan to have, because you said at some point you have eight, at some point you say 10. So no, you, this, this all has these fives. This, the, and we, when we were talking about it, I was just like, well, we have room for more, but this is what we're going to follow what the architect recommends. So there's no amendment. I, I, I so you have to, all right, you'll have to live with that. Um, if this is approved, that you have to live with those parking. And I think you can work with staff. I think there's some places where the parking numbers vary from that. It's just a matter of making that um, consistent throughout your presentation and your application. Yes, I agree. Ms. Guachilla. Um, I, one thing I would recommend to the board that um, you can always make a possible condition is that if the applicant ever wanted to increase number of parking spaces on site, that they could um, submit updates set of plans and bring it back to the board at a public meeting. Mm -hmm if that's something the board wants to consider um, in case they might need more parking spaces and learn that redesign their parking layout might be beneficial to them. I don't know if the board wanted to entertain that as possible condition or if that's something that you want to keep in mind, figure out how to bring it up. You can, they can always do that. They don't need, we don't even need the condition for that. They can come back to the mm -hmm. board without okay. having the condition. Ms. Marshall. Yeah. I wonder if some of the confusion around the parking spaces is due to the fact that two of them are inside. So it may not mm -hmm. always be clear if we're talking about exterior spaces or just the, the total number of cars that can be parked on the property. So. Yeah. So all I noticed in the project application report, page three or page five of 18, <laughs> the parking spots with two parts, two spots inside 
and six running along the driveway. That's just a, a wrong number. Um, and I guess it has to be, we have to, and then staff can confirm that, uh, yeah, so we have to just make sure that it's all consistent all the way through. Okay, that's all that's about. Thank all you. right, and you need um, two spaces per unit and you, and you have a sufficient number there. All right. Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I just be to confirm something that I think you said, um, I'm speaking to the applicants at, during our site visit is that this new unit will be owner occupied. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Wachilla. I have uh, two things. So the first thing is I wanted to say that um, the existing structure is considered a non-conforming structure because it encroaches on the side yard and front yard setback. So one thing the board has to do when it's making its findings is that it has to make a finding under 9.22. And Steve, I did include that in the project application report under findings, all the sections that the board has to go through. Right. Um, because of the fact that um, they're doing any work to a non-conforming building, the board has to make the finding that uh, it won't significantly disrupt the character of the neighborhood and you're essentially granting them permission to move forward with doing any reconstruction on a non-conforming structure. Um, nothing about the setbacks are really going to be able to prevent it from going forward because they're not encroaching further into those setbacks. They're actually going to be building more on the other side where they have more room to do so. But again, the bylaw kind of is word in the way that you have to make that fine in order for them to even do anything at all. Um, and the other thing I want to ask is that um, going through the permitting history, there was a demo delay that the applicants filed for with the historic commission. I believe the applicant also has a demolition permit that was issued to them as well. So, or at least you're in the process of doing so. So I was wondering if the applicant could speak to that and just talk about the status of that demo delay and, and what the situation is. Absolutely. Um, that was uh, years ago in 2016, I want to say, when we were working with um, Russ Wilson, a different builder. And um, and he had a, a bunch of ideas that he, he sold to us, but ultimately we didn't find that we wanted to continue working with him and pursue that project whatsoever. I happen to really love Taylor Street, our property on Taylor Street. And um, and so I didn't didn't follow what he wanted, um, didn't follow his recommendation, and I'm really glad that I didn't. And now I have a builder. I'm sorry that he's not here. I did text him, um, who is willing to work with me the way that I want to be worked with, uh, and I want our property to be worked with. Um, Russ had a significant disregard for it, so I didn't pursue it. So one of the questions that we have to deal with in the converted dwelling is the increase in um, gross square footage. Generally, for a converted dwelling, you get 20% increase in gross square footage. There's an exception, you can have up to 40% increase in gross square footage. Um, in, so resulting habitable space, if you meet two of five different requirements. And for your property, you're right about, you may even be a little bit over, but my calculation is that you're at or just barely above the 40% number in gross new um, habitable space. Um, but isn't it due to expanded footprint? Well, this, this is why I'm really glad we have our two Robs here to try to explain this, because this is confusing to me and I hope that maybe they can, maybe Rob Mora, can you, explain to us the 3.3241 converted dwelling and the gross the increase in gross habitable space and the five different two of the five different criteria which has to be met in order to approve a special permit yeah and, and this is a tricky part of the bylaw uh this particular section but you know I want to start with what the applicant's proposing 
and uh, because they're proposing a very uh, modest increase in uh, habitable, you know, footprint resulting in habitable space. And that was in the sheet that they started talking to you about their page six of their plans. Uh, so the way that that works, how they're being, how they're proposing it is that they calculate the total resulting habitable space after all the improvements are made. Uh, and that deducts uh, spaces that are not counted in that calculation, like common entrances or stairways. Those are not included in that figure. And then they figure out how much new footprint is, is being uh, proposed, and that's their 222 square feet. So uh, the resulting habitable space is that 3,600 square foot figure, and they're adding 22, 222 square feet of new footprint and that gets 6%. That's what they're proposing. I think where there's question is that there's a significant amount of structural work being done to a portion of the barn and connector that can only make you wonder, is this reconstruction or is it existing? And they're proposing that it's existing and that's how, and they can you know, give testimony to this, but how I understand what they've told me is that they're proposing that their builder is going to leave the structure mainly in place and um, you know improve it. Uh, we've been round and round about this over months with with the applicant because you know it was um, hard. We wanted to understand it as well. Uh, so that's the proposal. If that isn't the case, or if the board finds that the level of work being done is constitutes constitutes demolition and reconstruction, then you get into that 20% and possibly 40% with the additional criteria being met. Um, so I don't know if you wanna save that until you decide if you actually need to have that conversation because the, the application is proposing a 6% increase. Uh, so much below the 20% threshold. And the 6% depends upon a judgment that this is not um, new construction, that it's really shoring up the existing building and not not having new construction. Is that right? We're so it's close. So the, the language in the bylaw is demolition and reconstruction. Right. That's that's what um, th that's how it's it's termed in the bylaw. Uh, there's two there's two instances where the, the square footage, the new square footage counts in that calculation. It's new building footprint, which is the 222 square feet and reconstruction after demolition occurs. Those the whatever that habitable space is of that reconstructed area. Those are the two figures that uh, would count in that calculation if, if the board feels like this is too much work to not to you know and triggers the the demolition reconstruction clause well that's I mean, from my standpoint that's a hard judgment for a layman to make i mean to look into the uh, and say what's going to happen and it seems like that's more a question for you know the builder and for you and staff to, to look at this and say um, this is more demolition and reconstruction or it's kind of an addition. I, I see yeah, a lot of I, Yeah, I understand. What am I missing, and, what am I missing there, Rob? You're, you're not missing anything. You're, you're hung up in the same place we were months ago. And, um, you know, we talked it through multiple times uh, with the applicants here. Uh, and, you know, it's really, you know, we've agreed. I mean, the, pro the, the application moved ahead because we agreed that it could be done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as long as we had that commitment and they brought in their builder uh, who's, you know, up to the challenge, I suppose, to, to do it this way. Um, you know, we, we certainly, like I think anyone else looked at it and said, oh, it's going to be easier to just tear it down, start over. Uh, but that's not what they want to do. So, um, you know, we, we've been through that. The, you know, the permit is essentially conditioned on that process that really, you know, delicate uh, alteration of that space, uh, careful uh, to not fall out of the bounds of the what this bylaw allows. 
Uh, and if they do that, we felt like they could they could move ahead under this provision and not have to um, get into the calculating uh, the 20 and 40 figures. Uh, and I think mainly we, we also thought that it wouldn't, it might not even you know qualify if that was the case because of the area calculation. So it almost uh, felt like they have to do it this way right. to stay within the converted dwelling uh, requirements. Okay. Got it. So I'm looking um, to see if people have questions, board members have questions. Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I'm also surprised that <laughs> I gather there's no technical definition of demolition. Um, to me, to me, it means you knock the whole thing down, which which is not the intention here. But I am wondering if there is a risk to the applicant if as their builder is carefully taking off what needs to be, if the whole thing just collapses, if it's not as sound as believed, are they just going to be stuck, uh, unable to proceed or, you know, what? They would have to redesign it and come back? I don't know. I just wonder. I can speak to that. Have you, yeah, go ahead. Ms. That's exactly the conversation I had with um, Mike Stoltz, our, our contractor, um, how, how to do this. And he said, oh, what you do is you, uh, he would have his sons, Tyler and Cody come and brace the entire uh, structure, um, brace the, the walls and the framing of the structure. And at that point with it all braced, uh, he would start to excavate and adding for the concrete foundations and so on. And, um, and at that point, begin uh, shoring up the walls, adding additional framing and structures, um, poles, not poles, they're um, posts. Posts. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, to make it all, you know, beautiful and strong uh, and retain the um, the beautiful posts that are already there mm -hmm. as well. So it'll, it'll all be braced very carefully. Uh, so that way, um, it can be retained. And then once the foundation is poured, at that point, he'll start um, shoring up the entire structure and adding new materials. So it, oh, go ahead, Mr. Slaughter. Okay, so now that we're talking about the difference between reconstruct um, the proposal on that's being advanced, and the idea of demolition and then rebuilding. I'm trying to understand more clearly uh, how it applies to this structure. The, the connector, having been on, having been to the site on Monday, the, there doesn't seem to be much of the connector that can actually not be new construction. The the headspace on the first floor is inadequate to be a, a kitchen facility. So there has to be a new floor. And I can't, I, at least from my observation, can't see it being the existing floor. So it seems to me that the connector is going to be essentially completely removed I, I recognize the intention to salvage original building materials and king boards and refinish them and all that. But for the connector portion of this, it seems to me that it is demolition. It's a, it's a tear down with salvaging of building materials and then it would be reconstructed. And I'm not sure where the garage the barn portion, which would become the garage and the the upper floor and the loft storage space, how much of that will be quasi original? It, I and I don't, you know, I the building, the connector and the barn are in such bad condition, especially the connector, that it doesn't 
seem to me that there's a lot of modification and re and reworking of an existing structure. It seems more like a teardown. So I guess I have to ask Mr. Mora in this case for his opinion on whether or not this plan that's being proposed is actually feasible in terms of, of bracing and essentially, I understand the footprint wouldn't change, but how much of the existing barn building will be there at the end? The whole thing seems to me like a like new construction with some wonderfully salvaged original materials. But Mr. Mora, um, you know, how does it how does it seem to you? So if I'm allowed to ask, am I allowed to speak to Mr. Mora? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You just, you just did. <laughs> Well, so, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't want to not go through the official channel and go through Mr. Chairman Judge. Okay, I'm, so I'm referring your question to Mr. Mora. Thank you so much. So my my review and understanding of the project is solely based on the plants, not by any site visits. So you certainly have that advantage to this discussion. Um, you know, I believe that it could be done in theory, you know, according to the plan, the way it's being uh, proposed, talking with the owners, talking with the contractor and the architect, uh, it could physically be done. Certainly, if you're what you just described with the connector, um, you know, that could very well raise question to whether or not the connector square footage should be calculated differently and counted as reconstruction. Um, I'd have to see it myself to have a, you know, have a uh, uh, an opinion on that, uh, but I do think it might be helpful if you know the contract, the builder was able to explain to the board directly what it is that they're going to do, um, and and I think that would probably be the most convincing information uh, coming from the the source of who's going to do the work. Yeah, I, I, I'm. Uh, Go ahead, Mr. Slaughter. Four of the five of the panelists who are on this call were at that site on Monday, and I'm. Uh, I'd like to know if any if anybody thinks that my view of the connector part of the building is off base. I didn't. I didn't see much there that can be salvaged or won't be modified to the point where. <clears throat> it would essentially be new construction. I'm not trying to split hairs on what is new and what is not new, but I didn't see much of the connector that's going to be there at the end. Yeah, it's hard to, I have the same impression, but I don't have the expertise that a builder would have or, uh, but I, I could not figure out how, um, Mr. White, do you have a impression? Um, yeah, I mean, I realize we're kind of getting into almost a philosophical argument of Theseus's ship at this point. Um, at what point does it consider, you know, stop being his ship? But, uh, from what I saw, um, once again, I would kind of repeat, uh, what you were saying, Chair, Chairman Judge. I don't have the specific, specific expertise to speak to that. However, uh, one thing that stands out to me was when we were on the site visit, uh, the applicant kept speaking about how much pride they had in the American chestnut that's throughout the unit and how much of that they want to maintain, how much they want to utilize um, that. So, I mean, I, like I said, without any specific expertise, would see that as still maintaining, you know, the current position or current build. Ms. DeAngelis or Mr. White? When Meyer, you were, you had raised your hands and you wanted to respond. Please do. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I see your point about the connector. It's in very bad shape. Um, largely, the front portion of it is in bad shape, but that's also um, part of the proposal is to build that out by another five feet. So that doesn't matter so much. As far as retaining it, um, it shares a wall with the barn and shares another wall with the house. So. 
uh, it can be retained, absolutely. And then the back wall is um, supported by a concrete foundation, which is also going to be retained. Um, in speed, in to address the the height issue of the um, of the building. Um, how do you share? I'm going to have my husband uh, get to share a screen because I I have um, a drawing here that. Um, yeah, here it is. So on, I don't know if you, can you see our screen? Yes, can. Okay, great. So right now, um, you, I, if you see this line right here, it gets to, that's the, that's the height of the floor right now, the existing connector. Underneath the connector originally was like a larder. Um, so it was a, a dirt floor and something very shallow. And this dotted line here represents the height of the floor. And so obviously with the construction, we're gonna have to raise the, the height to make it habitable. And so this, this drawing here gets to um, where the floor will be uh, and the, the entrance. And, um, and it addresses also the height and also the existing floor inside the, the connector that will have to come out um, and be raised, obviously, to meet um, a code for building. But the the three walls of the connector, the the left, the right, and the um, the back of it, are going to be able to be retained. But you're exactly right. The front of it is already um, speaking to my my builder, saying, "Take me down." <laughs> but yeah. And the roof the roof will have to be new. Yes, the roof will have to be new too. Yes, the roof line gotcha. of the entire structure will have to be new. And on this page, uh, page A-3.1, it shows the um, existing roof line that's there now and um, and what uh, the, the application is to change that. So we're keeping the same pitch and things like that. So, uh, other questions, uh, Mr. Sloboder? Well, I certainly see your point that the common wall between the connector and the existing dwelling and the connector and the current barn, uh, I'm looking at your, at your diagram here. Um, I, I take your point that those will remain uh, I mean, a question could be asked if if it's a common wall, then the wall is as much part of the other two, the the dwelling and the barn as it is of that. But within the space of the connector, it you you refer to raising the floor, but you're not raising the existing floor. You're going to put down a concrete base and then build a new floor and a new roof and new supports. So everything between the two common walls that you mentioned is going to be new construction, is it not? No. It's, it's not. No, okay. the, the existing framing that's there now is going to stay. Um, the, the, existing... the framing on the common walls. The framing on, on the common walls, yes is gonna stay and the framing at the back of the structure is gonna stay and the concrete foundation wall at the back of the structure is going to stay. So um, so that way uh, three sides of it are gonna stay. Will they be extended? Absolutely. Will they be reinforced? Yes, they will, but they're they're gonna stay for the whole whole thing. Um, oh, but the okay. front of I wasn't it- sure, I wasn't sure from our time at the site, if the back wall, was going to stay because the the back wall of the barn is in is in uh has has gaps and it's in bad shape also that you were going to salvage the back wall of the connector you're not touching it well we're going to be taking off the king board that's there but we're leaving the framing i see and putting the king board back yes i see okay okay thank you of course. How do you, how do you... No, Mr. Meadows. We don't have having, to share having built um, three houses myself by hand, 
no electricity. And having lived in another house that was the victim of a fire at one point, um, not in, Amer in Wendell, that had nothing left of it but a few framing members, part of the roof, and plastic on the walls. It was a little uncomfortable during the winter. Um, it, you, it's amazing what you can do with just a few existing pieces of a structure. And it never turns out to looking exactly new or being feeling new, but it has a feeling of what it existed prior. And I think that as was indicated, this is a philosophical discussion, not, not really a practical discussion. Could, I, I wonder, um, are we focused on something that can be resolved if we look at the 40% number and the, meeting the two of the five criteria? And that we maybe don't have to be focused on how much of this is new and how much demolition. And, and if we look at 3.3241, where it says, you can normally it's only 20% uh, of habitable space um, as, as that's the result of demolition and subsequent reconstruction, but you can have up to 40% of gross square footage of resulting habitable space may be permitted uh, and no more than 20% of new building footprint and you haven't hit the new that 20% number new building footprint. The remainder being the result of demolition and reconstruction. Um, if you meet one of or two of five different criteria, and so I'm wondering if if we are, we can that that is a a, a, a way to um, permit this project rather than trying to figure out if this is um, a lot of demolition and, and uh, less less than twenty percent demolition and. Rob, I guess, and or Rob or Rob, is that a, a, is is that something we should be looking at, or the applicant should be looking at? Rob Moore, you're first. I saw you unmuting yourself there. <laughs> um, I I guess I'd, I'd I'd only suggest you look at that if you feel you have to, because if you just very roughly take go back to that um, that colored uh, floor plan and you took the square footage of the connector and barn unit three square footage, that's over 40% by itself. Um, and I'm not sure if that captures everything because of the additional footprint on the lower level uh, might add a little bit more to that number. And if I recall, that's probably where we got stuck way back when we were looking at this as well. So if you go, that direction, it probably will require some redesign to make it fit to the maximum 40%. I see. Yeah, I did back of the envelope. I came up with 40.55%. Um, and that was just off the numbers given there. Not, I mean, it was close, but it was over 40%. Hmm. Miss, um, Mr. Wenmeyer, you had your hand raised. Do you want to opine? Uh, well, we've gone around this a number of times, and so we feel that the the presentation that we've made is according to, uh, you know, the numerous discussions we've had about how to best proceed with this. Um, I I should add that you know until just a few years ago, uh, when we started this process, there was wall to wall carpeting in that connector, and it was you know not super well maintained, but it was certainly a livable space and you walked around there inside safely. And, um, you know, I <clears throat> started gutting it when we started the process and uh, it has, uh, of course, deteriorated since. And it's been a, it's been a long road to get to where we are now. Yeah. Well, it seems that if, if we just look at, the, if we don't use the exception, um, you have an you have a difficult job in making sure that 
should um, some kind of catastrophe happen in the building, the remodeling process, that you may have to, you may end up with more new construction, more demolition than you anticipated. And you'd have to come back and that, that's the, you're, that's a risk you're taking on, I think. And um, I, I trust our contractor. He... Well, yeah, but I mean, but, but true, that's, and that, and I can't substitute my judgment for yours or my trust for yours, but that's, you should know that there's a risk that it might, you might run a follow this and project, if it's, if we approve this and you're not living up to the constraints of the special project, special permit, you may run into trouble trying to complete this. You know what would happen if they if they exceed that number, Rob? I mean, that Robber Robber, it would be the construction would have to stop. I would guess until a um, another determination or the special permit is is granted. Is that right? Well, th there's no other path to do this. Th th this is it. There isn't another use classification, so they have to right. make it work. So you know, I guess I'm going into this with their their. Intention is to follow the bylaw, and uh, you know the contractor is committed to it, and that's you know that's how we go into this project. Yeah, I really wish the contractor was on to would, uh, would trust me. I, 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 I know, and I and, I, and I and I'm not, and I'm in. I admire the <laughs> your, your your desire to do this, um, but I I would really like to have the the builder speak to us. I think that would make a lot of make us feel better and more confident in what he's doing. Ms. Marshall. I, I reached out to him. He, he know, said he would, he would do this. He committed to it yesterday. I yep, sent him a contact. I, I know. Ms. Marshall. Well, I, I just, um, yeah, during the site visit, um, Ms. DeAngelis told us about the delays because of the pandemic. <laughs> because her architect died. I mean, and the, and the longer the delay, and then you said a tree was like resting on top of the roof. I mean, the, the longer it takes to start renovating it, the harder it's going to be. I, I appreciate that. I don't know if you, if you, Mr. Chair, you said by your calculation, you got 40.55. Yeah. Is that a hard, is that something, because that's like, so little kids is that something we have the power to wait it's or say no we can't we can't wait no that. that's not it's a 39.99 it wouldn't be a lot of redesign but they would have to if my number and my number is yeah. back the envelope number you know you have okay to have okay but the principle the yeah. <laughs> you yeah. May, yeah okay um so if if the applicant proceeds and the barn collapses, and Mr. Moore has said there's no, they can't, they can't build anew to this plan. Then, then they're stuck with the the house and the connector and barn have to be just removed, demolish, finish the demolition and remove it. I, I assume, um, which would be very sad because. Um, they add so much, <laughs> that design adds so much to the character of the neighborhood and it's the kind of thing we would like to be able to preserve. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm just saying, I hope, I, I hope they can make it work because it would be too bad to have to remove those structures. Agreed. As people who love Amherst and we see a lot of buildings go up that on our street, even that frankly don't fit any kind of, you know, historic character. Not that, you know, um, we would like to. It seems from our perspective like a, a no brainer. We have a garage. We would like to retain it and and, and we can. Make, make something useful uh, with it and make it look like it was a barn in the past. And people can look at it and see, hey, this was part of the neighborhood and the history maybe of it. And uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think we've talked this particular issue, partial issue through quite a bit. I'd like to open it up to other, if there are other concerns, questions board members have of the applicant. Um, and then we can come back and we'll come back and go over everything again. But is there other 
issues or questions that board members have. I'm just looking through my notes here. Oh, I had one question. So the um, the screening of the you you have a you have a chain link fence that borders uh, your, on your property, and that you have vegetation in that screen that chain link fence that and um, would serve as a screen for the lights for headlamps. Is that correct? Um, and I didn't focus on that during the site visit, but is that um, what happens in the winter? with that foliage does it disappear and the screening goes away or what is it is it ivy in the the that's running along the chain link fence how does that provide screening when there's when it's um when it's winter great question um so uh in what well, it's it's dense with concord grapevines and they're 100 year old vines they're gnarly and wonderful and they produce wonderful grapes. So if you want grapes, come to my house. Um, so that's really dense there. And in the winter they do, um, you know, the leaves fall off and things like that. So there was two things that we, um, uh, that our architect told us about. One is angling the, uh, the cars at the back of the driveway to yeah. kind of face um, more foliage that's, that's there. There's, um, you know some small shrubs and things like that and uh, and there's a tree there too and the other is um with the direction of the cars they actually um face the back of somebody's garage not a resident not a house or anything like that no windows and the other thing is that we can get those slats that go through the uh, chain link fence that um, you know, they're, you can't see through them. They're plastic slats, you just weave them through and that also would help. So in the winter, the slats would keep down on the light and we'll, we'll, we'll leave them there. And then in the spring, summer and fall, the vines are dense there. Okay. All right. Other questions, comments, thoughts from board members about this application? If not, let's turn to public comments and see if there's any, I don't think there's any public comment, any members of the public who are, and we've had no public comment uh, registered. Have we, Rob Wachilla? No public comment, okay. Nope, and the only person we had in attendance uh decided to leave so we have nobody <laughs> in attendance anymore all right well then back it's back to us guys um i think our philosophical conversation drove them off <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> zoning 101 will, will put most people want they most people want to go to another room um miss marshall so it's, it's unclear to me whether if we all believe this is, you know, it's, re, re, it's not demolition, it's repair and, and improvement or renovation, whatever, and it can be done. Is there still a question, though, about meeting the square footage? Because I, I, I don't think so. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, my two Robs, but I think we don't think this is demolition and reconstruction. They fit within the the, the twenty percent number, and because it's only a six percent square foot uh, footprint, I think that's correct. That, yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. And basically, this is new habitable square footage that didn't exist previously, but increased. So I guess it's the difference between the new square footage and the existing square footage. That's the number that's calculated in that percentage. So the difference is 6%, which is well below the 20. So in terms of just sheer square footage, it's not an issue. It's more about the percentage of the building that's going to be demoed entirely and rebuilt from scratch is the way that at least I interpreted that section. Right. But my question is, if 
if we are satisfied that this is not a demo pro project, then it complies with the. That's yes, right. that's correct. Thank you. Yes. It's, it's really a, yeah, it, that's, <laughs> that's the issue. Do we, does the board need or can ask Mr. Moore to go visit it and give his opinion? Is that? We, we can ask that, but I'm not sure that that's the right role for Mr. Mora. I okay. Think, I, I'm not sure. I think it, 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 his expertise would be welcome, but I think what is his, his job is to, is to take what the builder says can be done and then make sure that it is, that as long as it's not outrageously inaccurate or, or hyperbole, that, that he, can, he can complete that with the applicant and the builder's assurance and if he doesn't, then I think it's Mr. Moore's responsibility to, to, um, to tell them to stop, I think. Right. Um, so it's not his um, job tell me to second guess. Really, I don't want to impose a restriction on your, your, your role, but that seems to me to be what's the correct approach. Yeah, I agree. That sounds fine. I, you know, I think what we've heard enough here about is that there's a portion of the structure that will remain. Right. And, and this board that has to make whatever interpretation they have to at the moment about demolition just needs to be satisfied that the amount of structure that you understand that's remaining and being built upon uh, does not constitute demolition. And, you know, I think that's reasonable. I, I think uh, you can be what Ms. Marshall had said, the complete removal to 50% to, and it's not defined. Uh, our, our, um, Demo delay bylaw that we use for uh, historic review uh, calls that at 25% of any facade. So if you look at the entire facade of uh, one wall of this building, you know you take the entire square footage, even that whole connector wouldn't equal 25%. So, but again, that's not the rule, but that's just a you know a guide. So depending on what you're comfortable with, um, and and like I said, we were. We were comfortable to have the, the, the application move forward based on what the, the contractor's intentions are. Mr. Wachilla. And also just to touch base on what was discussed earlier, you know, if you know they get the special permit granted to them and their their builder is confident that they can salvage the existing um, posts and you know not have to rebuild those from scratch and then make a good final product, if at any point during the process, you know, the for some reason, the concrete footings decide to deteriorate or something just crumbles and it doesn't end up working after all, they have no choice but to demo the rest of the building or maybe even keep the barn as an accessory structure. I mean, that's just that's just the reality of it. I mean, this permit is going to be their only way forward to, to make this work, but also, you know, they have to make it work this way or else they can't really do it. And they have to salvage the barn as something else. I think they probably wouldn't be able to connect it to the main structure at all. Yeah, it's, it, but that's a risk that they have. Mm -hmm. My impression is that's a risk that they have. Are, they have to be willing to take. And yeah. I just want to make sure. And with the nodding I see from uh, Ms. D'Angelo's and I think from Mr. Weinmeier, I think you understand that that you're taking that risk. Um, I, I think it's important that you do know that if if this should go forward. Um, I wonder if the, does anybody on the board have further questions for the applicant? If not, I'd like to move into public meeting portion where we deliberate this and can talk a bit about it. When, but if we need additional information from the applicant, um, this is the time to get it before we move into public meeting. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm, we're gonna move into the public meeting while keeping the public hearing open, uh, just in case we need to get more information. Uh, you know, I, my, my opinion is, I, I think this is a uh, heroic uh, undertaking on your part. And I also, and I, I think it's somewhat, uh, I think it's admirable too. Um, trying to save that old building is, is wonderful. Um, and it's clearly a boon to the neighborhood to get rid of what is a decrepit structure, uh, my words, uh, right now, and, and replace it with something that a, an owner occupant will live in the, in the neighborhood. It's three units, which is not, which is only permitted if you're an owner occupant. So I, I admire that as well. Um, so I, I, 
I have a lot of admiration for what you're trying to do. It's, I don't know that I would undertake it. Um, I really wish your builder was here to make us more comfortable with what was going on. And I don't know if other members, uh, and, I, and I hate to impose additional delays. And if I'm the only one that wishes the builder was here, then we'll just we'll continue to proceed. But um, I, that would be, would be helpful to us to know and it could give us some reassurance. But I don't want to add to additional delays. You've had enough with builders dying and, and trees falling. And, you know, I, it's been going on for two years already, and I don't want to overly, overly delay this. But I, I'm inclined to want to approve this, with, but I have this um, uncertainty that can, I think can only be answered. Maybe it won't be answered, but I think it could be answered if the builder was here. So that's where I'm coming from generally is I'm, I'm supportive of this. I think it's heroic and admirable. Uh, and I'd like to be confident that you could do this as you as you said, Mr. Meadows. Uh, if you want to compare it to something, uh, our previous applicant, if you recall the site visit there, and a lot of our judgment that 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 house might have been better off torn down than it would right. be to cover it. Yep. And I think this is this is just as admirable and just as viable, maybe much more viable than that was. Mm -hmm. And we approved that one on the basis that, that that's, it's good for the community. It's good for the neighborhood. It's good for the town. And I think that's very similar here. It is good for the community. It is good for the neighborhood. And it's certainly good for the town to have this in, in place. I think that's a very good point. Well taken, Mr. Meadows. Mr. Slaviter. Well, I would, I suppose I would like to hear from the builder, but I don't consider it all that necessary. If if we're going, if we're considering going forward based on what the applicant is conveying that the builder has said would be done and that it is credible, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced that there is not an element of demolition here. But I was sort of struck when Mr. Wenemeyer said that the design of the building was to restore this sense, the historic sense of it, that it would be a barn-like building and that it would fit in well in the community. Uh, if, if, we would approve this, which I'm also inclined to do, and it would go ahead under the definition, not of demolition and rebuilding, but of modification or whatever the other category was. It seems to me that essentially 100% of the risk is on the applicants. And if, if they, with their vision of what they want to do, which I also feel is good for the town and a positive development for the neighborhood. If they are confident enough to take the word of, and the plans of the builder and they're willing to go ahead with our approval and they assume 100% of the risk, if it goes wrong, and it has to be completely torn down, then they will have two, two units that exist today and a, um, a place to plant a really large vegetable garden behind it. And I would certainly hope that is not what comes to pass, but they are the ones who are, who are taking the risk. And um, that's a level of optimism that I probably don't share, except for probably, but I mean, I share it on their behalf. If it was <laughs> if it was my property, I'm not sure it would be a project I want to take, but I admire their tenacity. And I think that um, their willingness to assume the risk on this project with the vision that they have for it is credible. I don't really need the builder. We already have had, we've been told what the builder is representing. So yeah, it would be nice to hear from him, but I'm certainly willing to go ahead without him being present. Not dispositive in, in your view. 
the builder's present isn't just positive to your decision is what you're saying yeah i don't need the builder here to make a decision i'm you know especially because we're not really as mr morris said there's only one way forward yeah with this application so we are faced with accepting the definition of this project as not being demolition and rebuilding and if we're going to go ahead and the applicant's willing to go ahead with that at their risk i give them credit for it i don't i don't need the builder to uh to be present it would have been interesting but not essential thank you you had your hand up yes um yeah so I, as well, am inclined to kind of move forward with this. I think today, I agree with, I think, everyone that it would have been very nice to have had the builder on the call. Um, Mr. Chair, would it be okay if I asked the applicant a question? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so at the site visit, you pointed out the carrier pigeon holes. Uh, with the redesign, or not redesign, but with the build will that be something that will be included because I, and i'll tell you why i'm thinking of this uh, you were to work we were talking about maintaining the historic nature of the build and of the property um just something that i thought of yes i'm going to be retaining those boards with the cutouts and when i put back the king's board and the other vertical boards back to the finished structure i'll be putting those back too i, I think they're lovely and Ms. Marshall. So what everyone else has said, I I think it's wonderful that the applicants are willing to take this on and the sooner they get started, the better. So I just want to <laughs> prove this with all deliberate speed. Um, I mean, if the builder were here, I mean, it wouldn't make me any more of an expert, uh, you know, in judging this. So um, Mr. Morris, put in a lot of time, I gather, and and um, that's good enough for me. Okay. Other comments, deliberations, discussions? I guess the one thing I would say, I agree, and I, I hope this, I would like to see this go forward. Um, and it's the reason that we, the judgment that we're called on to make, and it's hard, is that we, based on our observation, do we think this is demolition and reconstruction or do we think it's building upon the existing structure? And we have to use that, we have that kind of judgment. That's what the, that's what the zoning bylaw is asking us, the judgment they're asking us to make. And you know, our job is to kind of protect the zoning bylaw in that we don't wanna have somebody just assert, I'm gonna be able to do this and, and, re, and, gonna, and not gonna demolish very much and they go in and demolish a whole lot. And we just didn't know it. So we're trying to avoid that. I mean, that's the, the notion. I don't think that's what they intend or anything, but that's the role we have to play. And that's why our judgment as to whether this is realistically demolition or, or new, and new construction or not is what the bylaw asks us to do. And I think looking at it, that it's reasonable for us to believe that this is not total demolition and total reconstruction that it's reasonable for us to believe that, uh, that this can be done with modern construction techniques and we don't have to, and, and we can fulfill our responsibilities under the zoning bylaw by doing that and making that determination. So that's where I come, that's how I come to my decision about this. And the reason that I'd like more confidence in that is because I don't really know what I'm, I don't really know, it's my just my judgment, but, but that's all the zoning bylaw really asks us to do is to use our best judgment. And we have people that have rebuilt fire ravaged houses telling me that indeed this is not impossible to do and that, that helps me as well. Mr. Meadows expertise helps me as well to get to that point. So I'm I'm prepared to think that this, this is something that we should approve and go forward with and I'd like to start that process but I'd like to hear from anybody else has anything else before we start the process of looking at conditions and looking at and making findings and then uh, deciding whether this should uh, special uh, this uh, application should be approved. Ms. Marshall. <laughs> so I just, you raised the interesting, in my mind, the interesting question of, well, 
So what happens on the ground during construction? Does anyone visit to make sure in fact it is being modified or renovated and not? You know, Ms. Marshall, there are, there's, there's going to be a number of visits by building inspectors and other okay. kinds of inspectors. But their job is not to, I don't think their job is to look and say, how much is this is reconstruction and not? I think they're looking and saying, is the plumbing right? Is the electrical right? Is the, you know, the, is the insulation right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know that there are people who are going to, whose responsibility it is to say, oh, is this going beyond, Mr. Mora, you tell me, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, they, they will. Um, you know, there, there will be concrete work right from the very beginning, you know, based on what we understand, there'll be structure still there. There'll be, you know, be supported, suspended, uh, so that work can occur underneath it. So I think it'll be very obvious to an inspector that, you know, that the efforts being made to retain the structure and build upon it. Um, it is the building inspector's responsibility to see through any conditions that you put on this permit and the, the general provisions of the bylaws. So that is absolutely something that we're looking at when we're doing our inspections. I think there's going to be me probably many opportunities to see it. Uh, when you when you go into a project like this, it's usually not done. Each of the steps are not done all at one time. Like if you're building a new building, maybe there's one foundation inspection for the entire foundation. This is probably going to be done in pieces and they'll be calling for us to look at portions so that they can bury, support, move ahead, and so on. So I think there's gonna be plenty of opportunity for the inspector to see that um, it's following through. And, and you certainly, the board can certainly put whatever conditions relative to that, that they like, you know, just reinforcing the the the, the provisions of uh, the converted dwelling section. Good, that's good to know. Thank you for that clarification. All right, I would like to, um, and move to consideration of conditions as we always do. Let's do consideration of conditions. Then we can make our, and um, then we can make our findings that we have to make based on the conditions and, um, um, and proceed that way. So looking at the project application report, uh, the uh, draft project application report, the first condition is, you know, the standard things have to be built as it was proposed to be built. And I think that's pretty straight, straightforward. Um, the second is that this remains, the second really says this has to remain um, in their ownership. If it does, if a new owner, they have to meet with the building commissioner to determine a further review whether the ZBA is needed. If it's needed, it comes before the, the ZBA at a public, uh, a, a public meeting. This is in essence, the same provision that we've used in other um, that we're using now commonly in our in our uh, residential uh, residential permits. Third is the uh, pretty standard again that they have to be built to the room has to be labeled and used as labeled. Um, the fourth says it has to be registered and, and permitted under the residential rental property bylaw. The fifth says the approved management plan shall be followed by the property owner and any changes to this plan shall be returned to the ZBA at a public meeting. Um, six is no more than four unrelated individuals shall occupy each dwelling unit. Seven is all exterior lighting shall be downcast, light fixtures and dark side compliance. Um, number eight, street numbers for both dwelling units shall be clearly marked with reflective signage. Nine, parking shall occur on improved services only. The parking shall be maintained as needed. I think we want to specify the number of parking spaces just so that we've got it down. And I think that number is uh, not nine for the whole up uh, for the whole property. What? Let's do it again. We got five outside and two inside, so we got seven. All right, we got seven parking spaces as laid out on page zero two. Rob Wachilla, you will just note the page that it's that it's laid out on. So we have the, the parking determined. Miss Marshall, I saw your hand up there when I was looking up. Yeah, um, about the. Sorry, where was it? Oh, number eight. Yep. Street, num street numbers for both dwellings. I don't understand that. There are three units. So but there's two dwellings. One. There's the, the front building and the back building. The, the existing building is one 
to all That's, of my Okay. All right. And then the back one is a second dwelling. I think. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not um, sure how that's well, all defined. No, you tell me. I was actually <laughs> going to ask the board. That might have been an error on my part. So we can always work to reword that condition. Um, so condition eight, you could reword it differently. Or you can ask the applicant really quick if they had any ideas for how they want to do numbering of the house or the three units. I don't know if they're going to do like unit one, two, three, or unit A, B, C, and just have it all under one. So, so keep it as 65 Taylor Street. And then maybe do 65A, 65B, or how you're currently doing it now with your two rentals. If you're going to maybe, if it's A, B for the first two, make the third one C or what the situation is. But I guess that condition should be reworded to say any sort of um, address marker signage for the building should be clearly visible from the street. That's the and point. I guess I guess each of the units, the main entrances for each of the units shall be also contain reflective signs as well. So you know which unit is which. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I think that's the spirit of what we want here. Just, we, you don't have to decide tonight how you're going to number them, but have reflective, have reflective and visible markings and delineations there. Okay. And Rob, you'll restructure that. Yeah. Condition. And I'll just, I'll just say that um, in terms of like the street address, I'm going to write in there as well that the front entrance facing the street shall also have the street number on it. So it says 65 on the front part of the building from the street with, with reflective signage, but then each unit entrance, I guess on the door or next to the door shall have each unit number or letter or whatever they're going to go with. So that's, that's how I'll, I'll redo that one to make it sound better. All right. We talked about nine. I, I just need some clarification on the difference between number four and number 10. Any dwelling unit on the property shall be rented. And then we said the property shall register with the residential rental program. Are those two separate acts, two separate things, or is that the same, or is that duplicative? Could you, um, Elaborate which conditions you're referring to again, Steve. That's my bad. Number I must four. have missed that. Yep. Number four, any dwelling unit on the property being rented shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the residential rental property bylaw. And number 10, mm -hmm. the property shall register with the residential rental program. I could eliminate <laughs> condition 10 because it sounds redundant. I did copy and paste a lot of these from a different permit. Yeah. So I just that's hard. Was... Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so condition four basically states that. Um, shall be registered and permitted in accordance. Yep. Yep. That's correct. So I'll take out condition 10. Number 11 is standards. Um, you Wait, I'm sorry. Point. I'm still confused about that because mm -hmm. there will be three dwell. I mean, maybe I don't know what a dwelling unit is, but mm -hmm. only two will be rented and the third is going to be owner occupied. So correct. Right? Mm -hmm. any, property, so any dwelling unit on the property being rented, it says. Shall be registered and permitted. Sorry, thank you. Sorry, my bad. And also, Mr. Chairman, um, could I ask the board which sheets that we should note in condition nine that talks about the number of parking spaces? I don't know if it was sheets, I guess, 0 0.2, their site plan that shows the parking spaces. If the board's okay with that, I can write that in as the sheet yep. that we're going to reference. That's the one I was looking at. 0 0.2 has, Okay. it, it identifies the parking spaces. Okay. All right. I'll note that. And I'll That's also take out, I will remove condition 10 from that list as well. Great. All right. Uh, 11, as we said, is, is sort of boilerplate or standard. We're using it all the time. A 12, at least one of the dwelling units shall be owner occupied at all times. Um, 13, any proposed signs for parking shall be designed in conformance with Article 8 of the zoning bylaw. That's the, the signage area and the parking uh, signage uh, provisions. And trash receptacles shall be screened from the public right of way. Conditions that suggest we may want to um, dis discuss how many persons are allowed on the property at all times um, with the applicant. In the typically, what we do is we ask. We don't do this without consultation to the property owners. So, and I, I do not remember if you have a limitation on a number of persons allowed on the property at any time in your lease. So uh, people tend to say no more than X number of people can be um, at the on the property at any one time and the number of and, and the amount of uh, time that people can have overnight guests and 
and uh, visitors. And I don't know if that's in your lease or not. So can you describe that to us? Yeah, uh, the number of people there at one singular time is not defined, but it is in the lease about um, people staying overnight or any extended stay or anything like that and how that would be dealt with. So that, that part is in the lease, but not a total number of persons there at any given time. So how, how many people, what's the overnight guest policy? How many people can be there in the lease? Um, it's expected that nobody, uh, no overnight guests will really be there very much. And if they stay for three consecutive nights, one person, I need to be notified. And, um, and, at that point, we begin negotiating what's happening with the overnight guests. So that that's delineated in the in the lease um, about people staying for consecutive nights or or anything like that. Um, but it's, but I don't have anything in the lease about total number of persons at any one time on the so property. One of the things is that in residential areas, people like to have a limit so that the party so if there's not. Parties. Now you're going to be eventually the owner occupants and be managing this, but until that time, at least, um, and typically that number varies between 10, 15 per dwelling unit. Um, so you're looking at 10 or 15 people for a party. Um, and that's what you look to control. We like to see that suggestion come from you as opposed to us prescribing something. Do you have, are you, what number would you come up with? Um, 15 to, per dwelling unit because it's for the women's crew team. Yep. And uh, they just had their welcome meeting um, where they just sat around in a circle on the front lawn and went around sharing like what they did in the summer and what they're looking forward to this year. I think the crew captains live in the apartment um, and uh, they don't have parties really uh, because they're up so early. They're, they're fantastic. Um, so you I-, may I not, You may not always have that great um tennis <laughs> those I, are, I actually those are wonderful him. tennis yeah I, actually, I call everybody's parents yeah i know you do that that's pretty amazing so what um, you're saying is that you're you're looking at 15 per floor so 30 in total floor because i okay. i think the women's crew team is over 20 people and so okay. i yeah so let's if you'd be comfortable with that let's yes. divorce, let's put a condition that says it's 15 people from each dwelling unit is a maximum number of people at any one time. Okay, so that's so that's about um, so just counting, I guess, in the rental units in the situation, right. that'd be about thirty people total on the property at all times. Okay. okay, so that'll be a condition, and you're okay. you're okay with that, right? Okay. That sounds fine to me. I'm uh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and you've you discussed the overnight stays in the lease. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So um, I guess it makes sense, Mr. Chairman, to um leave that out as a condition for overnight stays and just allow for the lease to govern that? Lease to govern yep. that. Okay. Yeah, to clarify how many spaces are proposing boards. Okay, that's, um, that one we've taken care of. All right, those are the conditions. Um, does anybody have any other additional conditions or are they concerned about any of these conditions? Mr. Sloviter, you look like you're concerned about something. I'm not actually concerned. I, I would like to understand something better. I'm, I'm not concerned because the applicants look healthy. What, what in, in this case where one of the units must be owner occupied, mm -hmm. what happens if there is a change of circumstances and the owner simply cannot occupy a space? I'm not asking so much about this specific one. I'm only taking two minutes because this is going to come up again. If there is a health issue, a, a health concern, you know, whatever, and the owners can no longer occupy the space, are they forced to sell the property? I mean, what do you do? Because are they then prohibited from renting the space? It would, trans, it would transform into three rental units at that point if they were allowed to. How does that work in this town? Mr. Mora. Um, so there could be a few different kind of scenarios here on how that would work. Um, generally, if um, the owner still retains principal residence, even if they're not physically there due to health reasons, 
temporary or otherwise, um, you know, that's, that's not really going to cause anything to happen. We'll work with, you know, those situations and until we understand longer term what's happening with the owner. But if the owner, you know, leaves, relocates, change of work, whatever might happen, establishes principal residence somewhere else, then uh, yes, they have to either return to the board to, um, you know, remove the owner occupancy condition if that's an option, if that's available, uh, or they need to uh, sell the property to somebody who will uh, owner occupy one of the units or convert it back to something that doesn't require the owner occupancy. Okay. So we've often had uh, two unit properties that had owner occupancy conditions that ultimately ended up just being a, turned back into a single family dwelling because of that situation. The owner wanted to keep it, but didn't want to, uh, wasn't living there anymore. Uh, so this would be a little bit different. Now for converted dwelling, um, you know, they could come back sometime if they weren't going to occupy it and uh, propose a resident manager in place of the owner occupancy. Uh, so that would be an option for this type of permit. Okay. All right. Thank you. Things happen. Yep. Okay. So I think we have uh, before us um, conditions to be approved. That includes um, conditions listed on the project application report minus condition 10. Number eight, Rob is going to um, rework. We're going to specify the park, the, uh, the sheet for this parking spaces. And we're going to have 15, a limitation on the number of people allowed at any one time to 15 per rental unit, a total of, of 30. Do I have a mo do I have a motion to approve those conditions? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the conditions. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. All right, we've approved the conditions. So based on those conditions being approved, we have to go through and start making some findings. Now, normally I would just follow the um, staff project application report, draft application report, but this one, we have we really have to make the first um, non-conforming uses, the Article 9 and 9.22 finding. I think that's important that we establish that. The special permit, so that's on page 14 of the project application report. The special yep. permit granting authority is authorized to act under the provision of section 3.3 of this bylaw under special permit law of non-conforming use of a building structure or land to be changed to specify if not different in character or its effect on the neighborhood and property in the vicinity. So that's uh, it's not substantially, I can I think we can find that this is not substantially different in character or its effect on the neighborhood or in the or property in the vicinity. Said authority may also authorize under a special permit a non-conforming use of a building structure or land to be extended or a non-conforming building to be structurally altered, enlarged, or reconstructed, provided that the authority finds that such alteration, enlargement, or reconstruction shall not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming use or non-conforming building. That second sentence, I think, is really the applicable provision of this um, section, and I think that we can find that this will not, the, the um, use and the plan the applicant uh, proposes uh, and the alteration will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming or non-conforming building. So that's the what first finding I think we have to make. And if anybody objects to that, we can talk about it now, but I think we have to start there. And then we have to go to um, the converted dwelling section. So that's the, Section 3.3241. Um, it's existing structure is attached to an existing structure. I think we have to make a determination for that 3.3241. We've met the requirements of that. And we find that it's met the requirements of that. Um, 
So the property does not exceed the number of dwelling units that's permitted. Uh, there's no significant change in the exterior of the building except the special permit granting authority may authorize modifications. The building won't be significantly changed. So that's the staff review, and I think that's correct. The proposed conversion shall be suitably located in a neighborhood which is proposed and deemed appropriate by the special granting authority. That conversion, if in a residential, shall either be located in an area that's close to heavily traveled streets, close to businesses, commercial, and educational districts. And indeed, I think it is. The, um, it's close, uh, it, and it required resident manager or be owner occupied, and that is indeed the case. Um, and we've conditioned that the the uh, dwelling that the the project has at least one owner occupied unit. Um, we don't need any exemptions from the from the um, dimensional requirements because it's a pre existing non conforming building and lot. So I think we have met the it met the, the, the needs to make the findings under 3.3241 under uh, table three, article six, the dimensional requirements, parking regulations, the board needs to ask that to, we've done that, we have the correct number of spaces and it comports with the number required under the, the bylaw. Um, we can make the other findings under safety and, and uh, um, for the, that the parking is, it will provide safe transport of uh, and safe passage of people and cars. Uh, design standards and landscape standards. Okay, they've already proposed the um, that, that the parking area shall be paved in accordance with the zoning bylaw. The slope is okay. The setback is. Um, Let's see, expect when post structure no parking to build an eight feet of building. It's not, it meets 7.103, 7.104. Um, shall be painted or otherwise delineated. That's in the, um, the site plan that you have to have, you have to delineate the parking spaces in some way. And then you're going to do that with some cement markers or something, if I remember correctly. Um, your parking spaces are the right size and you have adequate downcast lighting for the parking area. Landscape standards. Uh, we talked about the chain lynch fence to um, mitigate light trespass to your neighbors and the, uh, the use of uh, slats if need be, if, it, if the 100-year-old uh, grapes don't uh, do the job in the winter. I don't want you to damage 100-year-old grapes, but I do want the light trespass to be uh, minimal. Um, so I think we've granted that. Um, I mean, we, we made that finding that you've met with uh, section seven. I don't think you need any waivers. Section eight, uh, sign regulations. We've dealt with that in the conditions and section, uh, is that fourth and uh, yeah, we've dealt with that in conditions. Article three, use the converted dwelling. Mr. Chair? Yep. Can I uh, just back up a second and ask about the sign regulations, Article 8. Yes. It sounds like some more significant signage than just a, you know, apartment A. I, you know, I, I look There's at that, I don't think, yeah, I don't think that. It's not a monument sign out front no. or something. It, maybe, Rob, you have. <laughs> well, they might, they might propose um, maybe signage for parking. So if they were to put like a um, sign on a tree or something, or if they're going to put a post that says park here, um, parking spot, um, that's totally fine. But then there's one thing I wanted to clarify with Mr. Mora, um, if he's still on the call, I can't really see everybody. Um, yeah. So in terms of marking the parking areas, the way I interpreted uh, 7.104 was that areas that had five or more parking spaces, I kind of pertain that as to physical areas on the property where there is less than five spaces as opposed to parking overall. So I was kind of confused by that language because I assumed that because they have four spaces grouped together on that back portion and then one kind of separate, that they wouldn't have to technically mark those spots. But 
I, I just wanted to clarify that and make sure that's the case. If not, then I guess the applicant would have to mark those spots with like a like a boulder or parking stop or something like that or signage. Mr. Morrow. Yeah, it's total parking spaces okay. to, to create the five because, you know, typically in designs or their, their parking spaces can be separated by landscape islands. Uh, so we do look at it as a total. Um, the wheel stop is one way to do it because you really can't paint on gravel. So it's either usually either signage or uh, wheel stops unless the board, because it's so small, they, you know, they also can waive any provision of Article 7 if they felt it was appropriate. Uh, given, you know, the particular circumstance, that'd be their choice. Real stops are pretty inexpensive and easy to do. That's just a cement barrier. Would you folks be, per I think the easiest way to deal with this is just add a condition that says you, you'll put wheel stops in for those four, five spaces. And if you'll agree to that, we can just add that to the conditions um, and we'll vote on that right now if, we, if that's, um, would, would, you, would you folks be amenable to that? I would for the four that are together. Yeah. The other ones that are on the brick pavers have big trees on either side. The kind of stops are kind of there already. I don't That's know. That's my confusion with the numbers. The, the ones I'm talking about are the ones that are angled and yeah. that they're we natural. All right. Yes, that was our plan. Correct. Yeah. Without objection, we're going to add a condition that the real stops be placed on for those four places. And unless somebody objects to that, we're, we're going to go forward with that. That's the easiest way to solve this problem. Good. Um, now we're into the converted dwelling section. We spent a lot of time talking about this, so I'm going to jump to the to the um, the quick here, and that is that I think this project meets the, con the criteria in Condition Eight of Section Three Point Three Two Four One that it is um, it is not contain it is not um, demolition and uh, rebuilding. Um, we've done Section Nine Point Two Two findings. Article 10, this is the 10.38 specific findings required. The first 10.380 and 381, is it suitably located? I think we can find it's in the residential district and it's compatible with the neighborhood. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387 generally deal with nuisance by a, a host of things. I don't think this deals with, this, this project does not appear to me to be detrimental to the, um, to the neighborhood um, and in, in anything, I think it, it's going to help with the fix up of a, uh, a really a dilapidated structure. 10.384 um, appropriate facilities, I think, are on site. 10.386 deals with parking sign regulations. They'll be in conformance, and we have conditions that will ensure that that's the case. 10.387 uh, provides convenient, safe vehicular traffic. I think we've already discussed that. 10.388 is um, does not apply. 10.389 Disposal storage, you will have appropriate facilities available for trash and, and uh, company pickup, and that's in your management plan. 10.38, 10.390, and 10.391, dealing with flood hazards and um, historic natural scenic uh, features, do not apply. 10.392, um, that deals with light trespass. Uh, I think that's we've dealt with that regarding the chain link fence and the 100 year old grapes. 10.393 is a proposal to provide protection adjacent property for the intrusion of lighting. Uh, again, that's dealt with but through dark sky compliant and downcast lights. 10.394 deals with the proposal to avoid impact on steep slopes. It's flat. I don't think this one is applicable at current. Um, and you've dealt with, and you have dealt with um, the concern about uh, water stormwater drainage into neighboring um, into neighboring properties. 10.395, the proposal does not create disharmony with respect to terrain use or scale, um, and and it's going to you're going to mimic the, the the current character of the building. 10.396, screening for storage areas. Um, they will provide screening for the trash receptacles. Is that correct? You'll have that done. Okay. 10.397. Green space for tenants to enjoy. There's a large area in the back that uh, could, could be used for that. And, it's a, and lastly, 10.398, the proposal is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the bylaws and the goal of the master plan. Uh, I think if that's the case, it's bringing 
additional uh, rent, it's bringing additional housing units into into Amherst. And I think it's a good use of the space. Um, so I think we can make the findings needed for all of those sections. We've made the, and I would entertain a motion to uh, approve the, the findings and make those findings in this, this uh, application. Do I have such a motion to approve the findings? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion about the findings? All right, if not, vote occurs on the findings. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. So we've approved, we've made conditions. Uh, we've made our findings based on the conditions that this, that the um, application fits with these findings that we're required to make. Uh, the last thing that remains is a motion to approve the special permit application and to close the public hearing and public meeting on ZBA, uh, ZBA 2024-01 and ZBA 2024-02, I think. We've got two different numbers here, do we not, Rob? We just have 20, 20 so it's um one. Sorry, it's 2024-02. That's the one you're yep. voting on right now. Yep. Yeah. All right. Numbers are confusing. Numbers are confusing. All right. 2024-02. Um, do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? If not, the vote occurs. This requires a supermajority of four votes to approve. Um, do I have a vote occurs on the motion to approve the special permit application and to close the public meeting and public hearing on this matter. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Slover. Aye. Uh, it's a unanimous vote. Congratulations, folks. You've got your special permit. You've got a lot of work ahead of you. I am, uh, I admire your tenacity and the uh, project you're undertaking and I wish you the best of luck. I think we all do. Yes, good luck. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. And we need all the luck we can get, honestly. <laughs> and um, the quicker we can get underway, the better. Uh, the, with Hurricane Lee or whatever, anything coming, I'm just, yes, holding my breath. Thank you. you. So I, I do wanna um, just go over next steps with you guys real quick, just so you're aware. So after um, the vote today, I'm going to work on next week a official record of decision, and then the board is going to sign that document once I create it. And once they sign it, I submit it with the town clerk's office, which starts the clock for a 20 day appeal period. And usually during this appeal period, members of the public can appeal the decision of the board to a higher court, land court or superior court. Um, and uh, after that 20 day appeal period ends, um, you have to get a certification from the town clerk that no appeal was filed with them for the special permit. And then once you get that, uh, you have to file the special permit in its entirety at the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds. And then once you do that, that's when the permit becomes effective. So you won't be able to officially apply for your building permit yet until after that 20 day appeal period has passed and the special permit has been filed. So do you guys have any questions for us? Oh, sorry, you're muted. You're muted, Mr. Winmeyer. You're. Thank you. That's okay. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Um, thank you. Good luck. Nice. Best of luck to you. Um, the, the next order of business for tonight's meeting is um, public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. I see we have no attendees. We've managed to drive everybody off <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> Um, <laughs> with this discussion <laughs> wouldn't be the first time, Mr. Chairman. Once be the first again, time. you've done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know why people aren't just riveted with our discussion. <laughs> but it just isn't the case. All right. There's, if there's no public comment, the next order of business is um, items that did not come up within the last 48 hours. And really, what that does is it gives us a chance to talk about schedule. And Rob, can you kind of go over that? Um, schedule that we have, what's coming up. I would love to, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah. 
So the next meeting we have is September 28th, and that is a uh, continuance from a previous meeting for um, 798-800 North Pleasant Street. Uh, it's for a proposed duplex to be constructed on the same site as an existing duplex, and both units would be rentals. Um, the applicant um, is working on getting some updated plans for that, um, but that is what's coming up next, um, and that's the only item. So that panel will be... Um, Hopefully they have it on their calendars, but that panel will be reached out to for that hearing. Um, and then on October 5th, we may or may not possibly have a 40B project that would be opened for that night. Um, it also might be on October 12th. It just really depends on what the applicant wants to do. Um, so we did receive the materials and a check from Valley CDC for a 40B project on Ball Lane, which is in North Amherst. Um, I'm going to review that when I come in. I'll be out of the office tomorrow, but on Monday. And they are looking to either open it on the 5th or the 12th, like I had mentioned. But um, I did talk to Steve, the chair, and he was thinking of making a alternative schedule for this hearing. So that would be every other Thursday from the regularly scheduled meeting. So what I'm going to do is once we get this application officially submitted, I'm going to reach out to members who are more available than others and are interested in serving on a 40B panel to, to do so. And then there's gonna be a schedule created for those specific hearing dates. In terms of October 12th and what we have scheduled that's not 40B, uh, we are in the process of scheduling a few more permits um, that are not officially signed off yet, um, both of which deal with residential uses. And then that's pretty much it. I don't have anything else that's on the docket. Oh, my apologies. Yeah, solar. Um, solar, solar, that's right. Yes. So right. that one's on the 12th as well. Right. And that one's going to pertain to discussing possibly uh, if we're going to do peer review for that project. And we anticipate that one's not going to take too long of discussion because the applicant still has to go to the Conservation Commission for their uh, wetland surveys and redelineations. Um, so that could take them a little bit more time as well. I have not heard any updates from them on how that process is going. We still have to schedule a site visit for that as well. So I was going to reach out to the applicant within the next week or two and just see if a site visit is still possible before the, the 12th. Um, and we'll go from there. And that panel also has been aware of that continuance date as well. Um, so as of right now, there's nothing else in the schedule. Um, that second meeting in October, there's nothing put in place yet and that's all i have so let me give you a little bit of my thinking behind the alternative schedule for the 40b i you know this isn't as complicated and a 40b application i think as the 32 northampton or the the um the, the cult the coals what's the name of the development up by north amherst that the beacon property north beacon yeah yeah, that was that was those are really, really long process, but 40 B is always long and and I think it made sense to me that we delineate a day the alternate Thursdays that we normally wouldn't meet on so we normally meet second and fourth, I think, and will be the first and third will the alternate Thursdays and we'll have very spe specific topics for the 40 B discussion so it won't just be long drawn out on everything we'll, we'll try to break it down on very specific topics for each of the meetings. I don't know if this is going to be six, five or six meetings, but I don't think it's going to be as long as 32 Northampton was. But I think it'd be much easier if we had the dates, the topics, we lay it out for the applicant easily enough, and we also it makes it easier for them to do the presentations. And we also want to know what to expect. So I think that makes sense. And then we have our ongoing work for the other Thursdays, as well as we have a really major uh, that solar project is not guys. Um, and I want to thank Craig for for uh, chairing that meeting that I couldn't be at. But that's going to be a big project as well. It's going to take a lot of time. And with those two big major projects going on, as well as the day-to-day -day, uh, special project applications we have, I just think that to get it all done, we're going to need to take some extra time and have some extra meetings. And that's going to impose on all of us. And it's not. And so when you get back to Rob about your availability to be on the 40B, um, 40B panel, to please know that that's going to hopefully be on the alternate Thursdays than we normally have. So it's, I think we're going to be taking a lot of time from people in this fall. Uh, Craig. Are we going to have a legal opinion for the 28th meeting? 
Um, we don't have one planned, but I could get one if that's what the board wants well, me to look into. I believe we asked for it. Okay. Yeah. That's my mistake. I will definitely look more into that. Well, actually, since we have Mr. Moore here, I think we had talked about this after that meeting about whether or not to pursue that. I don't know if you want to give us some background on that. Not really. I don't think this is the appropriate time to discuss. Yeah, discuss that. Yeah. yeah, fair. So I will, I guess I will have to talk to the town manager and see if we can um, do uh, that, but I'll definitely look more into that. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to be seeing a lot of each other this fall. <laughs> Uh, any other questions for Rob on the schedule or uh, for me or for your colleagues? Great. We're all done. We're going to be done before nine o'clock. Um, I thought, it was, and I'm glad to say that. And unless there's anything else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, so moved. Second. Second. Oh, there's got to be a second to that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> you want one. All right. It's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. This is not debatable. The, motion, the vote occurs. I, the chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. I suppose I'll vote aye. <laughs> Has arrived. I mean, I don't want to disappoint everyone else, but I can't get enough. My, my cat is telling me it's it's time. It's time. <laughs> well, I will say that the motion passes unanimously. Um, thank you all for a longer than anticipated night, and I appreciate your perseverance on this matter. So thank you. Have a good night. And thank, thank you, you Mr. Chairman. Good night. Good night, all. <laughs>